Hi all, this time we are talking about race. Uh, first we'll be defining the definitions of both race and ethnicity and some accompanying definitions. And we'll talk about demographics and then we'll talk about issues uh, commonly associated with race. Race is a socially defined category that is based on perceived or real differences between groups of people. So race is based on our physical appearance, which is based on biology, but it can vary based on society to society. So in that way, we know that different human societies have different ways of defining what races are what it means to be black in the United States today, what it means to be white in the United States today, could vary with another society in the past or another society globally, uh, which are very interesting concepts because we tend to think of these things as being um, set. Uh, common examples of race are uh, Latino. Latino um, is largely based off physical appearance. There are things to be said that uh, Latina is an ethnicity as well. Those are very interesting academic conversations. But uh, for our purposes today, we will use uh, Latina as an example of a race. African American or black, this is a clear example of a race. It is based on physical appearances uh, and largely understood across the United States. White, Caucasian, also similarly race, very clearly a race. Ethnicity, then, is a socially defined category based on common language, religion, nationality, common history, or cultural factors, right? So ethnicity is based on culture. Uh, when giving these examples, it's easy to talk about oneself. Uh, so I am white, and ethnically, I am Pennsylvania Dutch. The Pennsylvania Dutch are a group of German-descendant people that lived in eastern Pennsylvania for about 200 years without really moving. And then many of us moved out from there. Um, we share a common cultural heritage. Uh, we share common food ways, uh, some common religion. Uh, and there is a Pennsylvania Dutch language that is dying away, but still does exist in some areas. Somali people. Uh, here in Columbus, Ohio, where I live, there's a large Somali population uh, because of migration patterns that occurred in the late 1990s. Somali people are African or black by race, but uh, ethnically they are Somali and they have a very distinct culture in that way. Irish people. Uh, the vast majority of Irish people are white, but ethnically they are Irish. And Mexican people. Mexican people uh, are overwhelmingly Latino, uh, but to be Mexican means to come from Mexico. And it is different from being Guatemalan or being Venezuelan. Now, these are really important distinctions. Sociology see race and ethnicity as social constructions because race isn't based on biology. Uh, there is no specific set of markers within the human genetic code that determines race. We can see what your skin tone, what your skin tone is. We can maybe determine where your ancestors from fr were from, but none of those specifically indicate race, thus indicating it as a social construct, something that us humans have made up. Um, but that doesn't mean it's not very real. Uh, to be put in a social category uh, of human uh, by the rest of society certainly has very real implications for all of us. Racial categories do change over time, thus proving they are also part of our culture. Part of the history of the United States, and this is uh, deeply problematic and racist, is who is white and who is black. Uh, when uh, Irish people and Italian people first came to the United States in the late 1800s, there were racist arguments being made that uh, they were not fully white or that they were partially black. Uh, the Irish were said to have a black undertone to their skin. And that sounds like nonsense, and it is nonsense, but to people of that era, that sounded as viable justification as to why Irish immigrants should be treated poorly. 
another thing to point out is that racial categories never have firm boundaries. There are in-between areas uh, within racial categories, and those in-between areas can be especially broad when uh, it is socially acceptable within a society uh, to have mixed race relationships and then children of mixed race to be born. Now, these are important distinctions because depending on your racial identity versus your ethnic identity, the way you behave in those identity categories can change. Ethnicity can be either displayed or hidden, depend on your individual preference. So you can hide your religion. You can hide how you eat. You can even hide the way you speak. You might not like that or that might make you feel uncomfortable, but if it comes down to your physical safety, you can do it. With racial identities, we are talking about what your body physically looks like. Thus, it's dramatically harder to hide a racial identity than it is to hide an ethnic identity. Now, here we have uh, two ways that our ethnicities can behave for ourselves. I'm sorry, there is a typo there. There's a zero in every day. I should just say every day. Symbolic ethnicity is an ethnic occurs when an ethnic identity is only relevant on specific occasions and does not significantly impact everyday life. Uh, you can call this uh, ho holiday ethnicity. That's how I remember it. So symbolic ethnicity we see on St. Patrick's Day when people who may have very, very little actual Irish heritage, they claim to be very, very Irish and it means a lot to them. Well, the other 364 days a year, it doesn't mean that much to you, but today it does. Whatever, we'll let you do that. Uh, that's symbolic ethnicity. The traditional ethnicity, then, is an ethnic identity that can be either displayed or concealed depending on its usefulness in a given situation. Uh, this is ethnicity when beneficial. It is similar to the concept of... Uh, cultural capital that we talked about when talking about socioeconomic class. It is using your knowledges, in this case, your knowledge of your ethnicity to bond with another person in terms of, you know, uh, getting along with them. It, it's using your ethnicity when it benefits you. If, for example, as part of your ethnic identity, you uh, were fluent in Spanish and then you knew another, you were interacting with another person who's also fluent in Spanish, you can communicate with them in that way in our predominantly English speaking society that can be a little more intimate, that can be a little more hi, I am someone you can trust kind of thing. Now let's talk about the demographics of race in the United States. Here is what a demographic breakdown of the United States looks like as a whole. This is based on 2010 census information, uh, and we have every reason to believe that the 2020 census will look uh, pretty similar to this. Something might bump a couple points, but this is what the general breakdown is going to look like. Uh, you will note that the white, non-Hispanic, and the two or more races total population category are identical. Uh, that is a typo. Uh, there are there's one other minor minor typo on here, but I can't spot it right now. Anyway, uh, at current at the current moment, 65% of the United States is white, 16% is Hispanic or Latino, 12% are African American, 4.4% are Asian. Two or more races is 1.8%. And then with American Indian or Alaskan Native, that is 0.6%, so half of a percent. And then the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander is 0.1%, with other race being 0.2%. Now, the first most obvious question I ask with this uh, chart is, is this your lived experience? Does this look like the world you live in? Now, since... Uh, you're enrolled in this class for University of New Mexico, I am guessing that this does not look like your lived experience because the Southwest has a dramatically higher Hispanic Latino population than the rest of the world. Uh, in Columbus, Ohio, where I live, uh, this, uh, this is pretty accurate, especially uh, for the city itself. Now, if I go outside of Columbus, 
uh, that is way lower of a white population. Most of the people that live just outside of Columbus, Ohio, it's almost exclusively white. I would say it's at least 85% white. Um, other things here. Uh, it should be noted that it, I believe it was the year 2005 when Hispanics uh, became greater in number than African Americans. But like I said, in the Southwest, it's been like that for, for quite some time. Uh, the Asian category is uh, tricky there. Uh, that category um, is, is it's, a, it's a weird category. It's, it's, it's problematic because Asian, are we talking about people from India? India is on Asia. Are we talking about people from Saudi Arabia? That's, that's part of Asia. No, our social construction of Asian in the United States is the way we view it. We're talking about China, Japan, Korea, right? East Asia. But the way we commonly talk about it, there's, there's very much a, you know what we're talking about kind of situation, which is awkward. And is it racist? Yeah, probably is. Um, so that's weird. Uh, where do we put uh, Arabic people? Where do we put people from the Middle East? Do they classify as white? Do they classify as other race? Uh, that is a weird uh, place that our society as a whole has not come to a consensus to. The two or more races category, uh, the mixed race category, uh, it is expected that in the near future in the census, that category is going to change the most because it was actually a new category in the 2000 census. More and more people are identifying as being mixed race uh, for a couple reasons. First of all, it is becoming a category that we think more about. So people do actually identify as that category. Uh, additionally, uh, there are more mixed race uh, children being born because it's now more socially acceptable to uh, have a uh, mixed race romantic relationship. I believe I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit there. I think I talked about that in a couple slides. Uh, so yeah, our society is becoming increasingly diverse. I'm going to breeze over the things I talked about a little too much. Uh, Non-whites make up about 38% of the total U.S. population. We address that. Uh, Non-whites are projected to be the numeric majority by 2040. Now, what exactly does that mean? That is lumping everyone that isn't white into a big category and everyone that's white in a big category, which isn't super useful. What this looks more like for the dynamic of the United States is we will still have a majority. We will still have the most, the biggest category being white, right? So white people will be a plurality. That's what that's called. There will be the most white people, but white people will no longer be greater than 50% of the population. So that is a major tide shift in the power dynamics in the United States, but it does not mean by any stretch of the imagination that white people are disappearing. It just means that uh, we're we're having a different proportions in our society. The majority of babies under two years old, uh, according to the 2010 census, were non-white. That means, and of course, majority means over 51%. Uh, now, in all industrialized societies, we see migration as being the primary engine of population growth. Uh, when you have a society that's relatively stable, that's not actively at deadly war, that people have a relatively long lifespan. Usually your population rate is somewhere around 2.1 to 2.5%. That means for each two people in the world uh, that two people tend to be born, right? So every breeding couple tends to make about two to two and a half kids, whatever that means, right? Two to three kids. Thus, when people die, the birth rate equals out the death rate. Thus, when you have a population like that, like the United States has, like England has, like most society has, migration then is what drives population growth. And you will have migration if you have a healthy society, because societies that are not as healthy, uh, they tend to drift to healthier societies because people want better lives. Uh, I address this, the number of people identifying as mixed race is increasing. So 6.8 million people identified as multiracial in 2000, while 9 million people identified as multiracial in 2010. That is 
big, big jump, right? That doesn't mean that three million multiracial people were born between 2000 and 2010. What more of it means is that people are identifying as mixed race. Were there some mixed race people born during that time? Sure there were. Were there some, uh, did that cause a part of that jump? Mm, A little bit. But more of it has to do with identifying as being mixed race. Let's talk about some issues related to race. Uh, And to talk about these issues, we have to make a few Give some more definitions, because that's basically all this course is anyway. A minority group, in sociological terms, is a social group that is systematically denied access to power and resources available to the dominant group of society. Now, in these terms, we are not necessarily talking about numbers. A minority group is not necessarily fewer in number than the dominant group. We are talking about power. Does the minority group have less power and less access to power than the majority group or than the dominant group. For example, in South Africa, uh, during uh, the apartheid regime, uh, during that era of South Africa government, if you don't know what I'm talking about, Google search apartheid South Africa, you can read all about it. But anyway, during in that government, uh, 80% of the population was black, but the government was almost exclusively controlled by white people. So, black people in that case were clearly a numeric majority, but they were a, in terms of power, in sociological terms, a uh, minority group. Now, there are multiple ways we can define racism. Uh, So, we will look at a simple definition of racism, and then we'll look at a more academic definition of racism. Uh, Both of these definitions of racism are present in our society. But we need to know both of these definitions when having conversations about race because many people uh, have just the simple definition of race and racism, but without the more complex definition, we are missing a major component of how race operates in our society. So here is a basic definition. Uh, Racism can be defined as a set of beliefs about the superiority of one racial or ethnic group. And this is the definition of racism most of us hold going about our everyday lives. This is the definition of racism that most people think of. Uh, So when racism is in the mindset of an individual, they use the idea that a given group is better than another group to justify inequality. Why are black people uh, overwhelmingly of lower socioeconomic status? Why do they have less money than white people? Well, because something, because this person believes a racist thing, right? Well, because uh, black people are inferior or lazy, the racist may think, right? Uh, It's used to justify inequality. And many of these assumptions are based in ideas that some groups are genetically inferior to other groups. That's at least how the modern racist view things. Now, this type of racism is no longer acceptable in our society, at least in public, right? Uh, Your racist old grandpa may say something like this, but you certainly won't see public figures making racist statements, uh, at least without some backlash. It's It's not okay to be this way. Our society has pretty overwhelmingly decided. Um, But when racism does occur, uh, it is often accidental. Uh, It's it's very rarely intentional. And we'll come back to that point a couple of times. Now, a more complex definition of racism, we can see racism as a system of oppression that is embedded in our society. And this is a different thing. So this views racism as being part of the structures in our society and built into the system. So your definition really there is on the next two bullets where here's the definition. Racism happens when people are oppressed and people are oppressed when they are unable to do the same things as the dominant group in society, i.e., In our society, when we talk about uh, the dominant group, we're talking about white people, right? We're talking about the people who are in charge, the people with all the power, white people, pretty much. So, by these definitions, white people cannot be the subject to racism. 
Now, can white people, uh, can you hate white people? Should you? No, of course not. You shouldn't hate anyone. But are there people in our society who hate white people? Yes, they certainly are. Uh, are there people in our society who may do bad things to white people? Yeah, certainly. But because uh, racism is dependent on structure and because the structure of racism is set up against non-white people, then by this definition of racism, white people cannot be subject to racism because the uh, distinctions the barriers are not set up against white people in our society. And I think this is really important to point out, especially in an academic setting like college, because I have heard too many academics say, just to start with, you can't be racist to white people and end it there. Well, unless you've heard this and had this explained, that sounds like nonsense. It sounds like, hey, that's it can sound like, hey, that's hateful against white people. And it's not intended that way. It's intended to point out that the structural situation in our society is such that white people do not have the same barriers set up against them that black people do. And personally, that took me a long time to really get to, um, just to really wrap my head around it. Uh, but the more I study this stuff, the uh, more obvious it is. Now, let's talk about some different ideas that go with this. Uh, prejudice. Prejudice and discrimination, sometimes these are used to mean the same thing. They are different things. Prejudice is a thought process. It is an idea about the characteristics of a group. It is applied to all members of that group and is unlikely to change regardless of evidence against it. Thus, um, if you think something about an entire group of people, and you are given some piece of information to uh, change your mind, you won't accept it because prejudice isn't science, right? It's a rational thought. So uh, if a racist person is forced to work, uh, someone who's racist against Latinos, uh, who is forced to work with a Latino person uh, and thinks all Latino people are lazy, but this person that he's working with is not lazy, he'll say something like, oh, well, Sam here, he's one of the good ones, right? Whatever that means, right? Um, they, they, they make distinctions between good ones and bad ones, but still being able to believe that uh, they're, you know, they're overwhelmingly right, right? Racist mindset. Uh, discrimination, then, is the unequal treatment of individuals because of their social group. So discrimination is an action. Discrimination is acting on prejudice. Uh, and discrimination is usually motivated by prejudice, not always, but in most cases. Now, individual discrimination is discrimination carried out by one person against another person. So, for example, uh, a landlord doesn't rent to you because you're black. Uh, and, of course, that person wouldn't give that as the reason. You don't have to give the reason for discrimination. You don't have to state it that way. And in most cases, uh, people that discriminate don't say it, right? Um, but that's an, a case of individual discrimination. I am discriminating against you because uh, I believe these negative things about your group. Uh, now, instances of individual discrimination are often based on implicit bias. Uh, if you want to learn more about implicit bias, I don't have so much time to go over it uh, as a specific idea. Uh, it is a type of subconscious bias that is pre present in most people's brains. Uh, we have been wired by our society to believe or accept certain things about other groups of people. And this is really an amazingly interesting uh, concept. And I do encourage you to uh, maybe Google search the terms implicit bias test, Harvard, or implicit bias, Kerwin Institute, Ohio State University. Those are uh, two areas uh, where there's really good material. Harvard and Ohio State are doing some amazing uh, research regarding implicit bias and how it impacts uh, the way that we behave. Now, institutional discrimination, systematic discrimination carried out by social institutions. So these institutions may be political, they may be economic, they may be educational. 
and they uh, affect all members of a group that come in contact with it. Uh, thus, a condo association could have rules against renting to African Americans. Uh, it, and th this is currently illegal, right, that kind of discrimination. But it once was uh, pretty common before laws changed in the 1960s and 70s to have those kinds of racist rules on the books. So if you were kept from uh, living in an area because of your race, and that was in the rules, that would be institutional discrimination. Uh, what this more looks like uh, in our modern world, it, it's more unintentional. It's more subtle. So the best example of this is the company College Board that uh, puts together the ACTs and SATs. Had problems for quite some time with uh, wordings on uh, those tests that were a bias against people who were non-native English speakers. So you could be completely fluent in English. And uh, there were especially there were some math problems, especially there were other problems in there where they required a certain knowledge of American culture that really wasn't testing your mathematical ability, but was uh, but really biased people who were native to the United States. And that kind of subtlety, that's what institutional discrimination often looks like. Uh, one example of one of these questions would be something along the lines of uh, a baseball player is runs from one speed, at one speed from home plate to first base, and at another speed from second base to third base, assuming the average of those speeds, how long did it take that player to run around all the bases, right? Where that requires a pretty basic understanding of baseball that most people would have, uh, even people not interested in baseball. But if you came from another place where baseball was completely foreign, even if you spoke the language completely fluently, then that question that was aimed to measure your math ability uh, would be unfairly biased toward you. And there were a number of lawsuits uh, in these regards. Um, and College Board has fixed most of that stuff, uh, but uh, that's a real good example of subtle discrimination. Now, this is completely uh, new, different material. Uh, these are different phenomena. Uh, genocide. Uh, genocide is the deliberate and systematic extermination of a racial, ethnic, national, or cultural group. Uh, the most uh, nef ugh, nefarious, uh, notorious uh, genocide in world history was the Holocaust of the Jews during uh, World War II. Um, but there were genocides before that. Uh, the treatment of the Native Americans uh, in our nation's history, if it wasn't genocide, it was very close to it. Uh, the uh, dispute between the Hutus and the Tutsis in Rwanda in the 1990s, that was also an example of genocide. The Armenian genocide that occurred uh, very close in time to World War I, that was a genocide. Uh, the uh, ethnic cleansing of the Serbians within the former Yugoslavia, that was, in retrospect, a genocide. At the time, it was not thought to quite be genocide. It absolutely was. Population transfer, the forcible removal of a group of people from the t territory they've occupied. Now, population transfer, even if it is legal by the laws of the given country that it occurs in, is always noticed by the international community because when genocide occurs, it is often preceded by population transfer. Uh, the uh, Jews in World War II were first moved from their homes into centralized ghettos in cities and then from those centralized ghettos to the concentration camps. So that was an example of an elaborate population transfer. The most notorious population transfer, uh, there were several that have happened in American history. Uh, the most notorious population transfer was the Trail of Tears uh, committed against the Cheyenne people by President Andrew Jackson. He wasn't president yet. Uh, and that was a population transfer where, wherein thousands of people died. Internal colonialism. And this is the economic and political domination and subjugation of a minority group by the controlling group within a nation. So we see this, uh, in a reminder, colonialism was a system uh, 
set up by governments in the 16th, 17th, and 1800s, where uh, countries would be set up to be uh, subordinate to other countries, right? So the United States, the original American colonies, were a colony of Great Britain. Uh, Great Britain also had India as a colony, and those colonies were expected to feed natural resources to the mother country, right? That was colonialism. Uh, internal colonialism occurs within one country's boundaries. Uh, the Appalachian region in uh, Kentucky and Tennessee and southern Pennsylvania, that region, it could be said to be a type of internal colony. There are very few major cities within that region uh, because in the 1800s and early 1900s, most of the wealth of that region was funneled up into New York City and Chicago, right? That created a, there should be more major cities in that zone. That's internal colonialism. Any area where in a wealthy country such as the United States that is overwhelmingly poor but has great natural resources could be in a situation of internal colonialism. You could make some interesting arguments that New Mexico is in a inter internal colonialism uh, situation. You can make arguments against that too, but it's an, it's an interesting conversation that could be had. Segregation, we in our country have a pretty good uh, teaching in our history classes of what segregation was. It was a horrendous moment in U.S. history, but I don't need to go into too much uh, detail with it. This is when uh, black people and white people uh, were made to use different facilities in much of the south or southeast, uh, and that's basically what that looked like. Assimilation. Assimilation uh, occurs when the minority group is absorbed into the mainstream or dominant group, thus making society more homogenous, thus making society more all the same. And for a long time, assimilation was the predominant ideology to be used in the United States whenever any um, minority group interacted effectively with the mass of white people in the United States. This can occur in two ways. It can occur via racial assimilation or cultural assimilation. A racial assimilation occurs when racial minority groups are absorbed into the dominant group through intermarriage. So... And I'll talk about both of these and talk about examples. Uh, cultural assimilation occurs when racial or ethnic groups are absorbed into the dominant group by adopting the dominant group's culture. Now, either of these can occur in a more kind of natural, friendly sort of way. Uh, whenever any two groups of people are living in the same space at the same time, people will naturally uh, have sex with each other, have relationships, form families, right? So that's what racial assimilation looks like. Uh, anytime people live in neighborhoods or areas together, those people will uh, share food ways, share culture, share things. That's what cultural assimilation looks like. And that can be that can be relatively friendly now or it could be not friendly. Uh, there were many instances in the 1800s and first half of the 20th century when uh, Native Americans and other groups were forced into racial assimilation and cultural assimilation. Uh, the first Indian schools uh, that were set up by the U.S. government and some religious organizations were set up to break the culture of uh, Native peoples. Uh, children were abducted from their families and they were taken hundreds of miles away from their families. Their hair was cut, which was a big deal depending on the tribal identity. Their clothes were changed and they were forbidden from speaking their native language. They had to speak English, right? They were taught how to be English. The slogans of many of those schools were literally, kill the Indian, save the man. That was the concept, right? Thus, that would achieve both racial assimilation and cultural assimilation. These single-sex schools would be separated from their, their people and uh, from... Uh, males and females were separated, right? That thus having the effect of uh, strongly encouraging, uh, forcing uh, young native boys and girls to only find romantic partners with white people predominantly. Thus, even racial assimilation. 
cultural assimilation, uh, forcing those native children to uh, abandon their um, their their culture. They wouldn't know their food ways. They wouldn't know their religion. They wouldn't know all of these things. They would lose their language, which is a it's a tremendous loss, right? Uh, that is what happened there in many cases. Um, man, that's really all I have to say about that. That's some, it's some really heady stuff. And then pluralism. Pluralism is the thing we in our society try to do as opposed to assimilation. Pluralism is sometimes called multiculturalism. This is a pattern of intergroup relationships that encourages racial and ethnic variation within society. The concept of pluralism uh, encourages us to share our ethnic identities with each other, allows us to uh, do our, our ethnic things, if you will, and as long as everyone agrees to be polite, everyone agrees to be cool, everyone will be cool with each other. This is at least what we strive for now in many parts of our society. Are there some people in our society that think that this is a bad thing, that are threatened by this? Yes. Are they racist? Probably. Um, but we, as a society, are striving for pluralism and striving for multiculturalism. At least at UNM, um, I've been very impressed by their multicultural pushes, um, and I very much support that stuff. I haven't worked for... I've worked for some schools where I haven't been as impressed as I am at UNM. Um, so yeah, anyway, that is it for that lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know. This is really important material and really interesting material. And I look forward to talking to you about it.